All right, raise your hands. Who here owns a boat? Who here wants to own a boat? Who here wants a really good friend that owns a boat? These are your people. <laughs> Our speaker today began his journey as the CEO of Correct Craft as the fifth CEO in a row in five years. But since then, he has led his team to be considered the best of the best in the industry with a culture that he calls making life better. He also, for himself, has a focus on what I call the three Ps, which is people, performance, and philanthropy. Correct Craft is a marine manufacturing company headquartered in Florida, but has plants across the United States and, of course, distributes to more than 70 countries in the world. Now, he has more than 47 companies as subsidiary under Correct Craft, including eight boat brands, four engine brands, and I love this. Four water sport parks. So, having won almost every industry award, there is, I cannot think of a better person to reflect being an innovative entrepreneur. So, as I reached my 100 country goal, I'm pale in comparison to a speaker who has traveled to almost 120 countries around the world. And in fact, I want you to know, he also wrote a book called Education of a Traveler. And I read it. It's fantastic. But I want you to know, you all have books in front of you. And our speaker has graciously given each of you two of his books. So please take them home as a souvenir. He has a wonderful story to tell. Please join me in welcoming Bill Yurkin. I know I'm I'm throwing you guys a curve. I was going to stand up there, but uh, I think it's uh, I think we better be up here. So it's an honor to be here with you today. January of 1945. It was a really really difficult time in the world. Uh, we we're a few years into two world wars. Uh, tens of millions of people have been killed. Hundreds of millions have been displaced from their homes. And it was just a very, very difficult time. Uh, but uh, some good news had happened. Something good had happened. Uh, Hitler had overplayed his hand at the Battle of the Bulge. Hitler was getting desperate. And he had one last shot. And so he uh, did his last offensive at the Battle of the Bulge. And he lost. And so the Allied troops were moving rapidly across Europe. There was a problem. They were going faster than expected, and they had a barrier, the Rhine River. They had to get across the Rhine River. So General Eisenhower, who was the Supreme Commander at the time, he reached out uh, to back to Washington, D.C., and said, I need boats, and I need a lot of boats, and I need them fast. And so this, the military in Washington, D.C. reached out to this company in Orlando, Florida, Correct Craft, and said, we need boats, and we need a lot of them fast. Correct Craft at the time was building about 20 boats a month, and the military needed 425 boats in about 25 days. It was a huge task. But this is World War, this is World War II, so they shut down the city, literally closed roads around the factory. They built a railroad track right to the factory so they could ship the boats out of the factory and get them, uh, get them on their way to Europe. But it was a big challenge. The company agreed to take the challenge and said, we'll do it, we'll take it. But there was a big problem. They started building the boats. They got to the first weekend, they came to a Sunday. One of the company's values was it was not going to work Sunday. They didn't work Sunday. And the owners, the founders of the company, uh, the founder was still involved at that time. He believed very strongly that people needed to have a day off to rest, relax, spend time with their family, worship if they chose to, but to have a day off. So he wasn't going to work Sunday. So the military found out about this and said, uh, you're going to work Sunday. He said, no, we're not going to work Sunday. And the military was like, you don't understand. We need the boats. You're going to work Sunday. And the family said, we're going to have somebody else build those boats because we don't work Sunday. That's a poor, core, one of our core values and an important part of our culture. We don't work Sunday. 
So the military eventually uh, gave in. The company, the employees worked till midnight on Sunday morning, came back in again midnight Monday morning, and uh, they actually ended up building the 425 boats a few days early, even with taking off the site. So they'd asked two other companies to build 425 boats also. Both of those companies working seven days a week uh, were unable to meet there. So the company ended up building an extra hundred for the companies that couldn't make their commitments. So one of the core values of the company was that we wanted a day to rest, worship, relax, and that was important to our team, important to our employees, and the company stood by that. And uh, obviously made, it made its commitment to the military. And even today in the military records, it's known as the miracle of boats. So the company, uh, company came out of World War II, was doing well, got into the late uh, 50s, about 1960, and got another government contract, a big government contract. And uh, so I was really excited at this government contract. The company's on a great trajectory. But Washington, D.C. sent down an inspector, an auditor. And the inspector came and met with the owners of the company and said, I, I want a bribe. He was a little more subtle than that, but basically he wanted a bribe. And the owners of the company said, no, we're not going to we're not going to pay bribes. We don't do that. We're not going to do it. Wasn't a lot of money in the scope of the overall contract would have been a lot easier just to go ahead and pay him and be done with. The company said, no, that's not who we are. That's our values. That's our culture. That's what we're not going to pay a bribe. So the auditor ended up rejecting boats. Long story short, it's in the blue book you have there, Making Life Better, this and many other stories. But long story short, put the company into bankruptcy. And the company went into bankruptcy, went through the bankruptcy process, and uh, creditors got 10 cents on the dollar. So millions of dollars worth of debt was um, taken care of in the bankruptcy. And the, company, the vendors got 10 cents on the dollar. Many of them weren't happy about it, but what could you do, right? That was the law. They went through the bankruptcy. They reorganized and reopened. And the family, uh, one of their values was to pay people what you owed. They didn't have the money to owe. So they took the profits of that company for the next 20 years. For the next 20 years, the profits of that company were all spent paying back those vendors until they eventually paid 100% of those vendors back. Now, 20 years later, some of those vendors weren't even alive anymore. So picture this. It's 1980. You get a knock on your door, and somebody goes to the door, and they open the door and uh, say, what's up? And they say, we're with Correct Craft. Your grandfather, who passed away 15 years ago, he had a supplier in Orlando and we owed him $5,000 that we weren't able to pay him back in 1960. Here's a check for your family for $5,000. There's an important, thank you. So the company spent all this profits for 20 years. So it was an important part of the values and the culture of the company. This company that I'm talking about, of course, I'm sure you know, is Correct Craft, the company that I'm honored and have been for the last 17 years to be the CEO of. And it started in 1925. There was a family in New Hampshire, the Maloon family, and uh, they wanted to move to Florida, as many people have over the decades, wanted to move to Florida because they saw opportunity in Florida. So they moved to Florida. They started a boat company called Correct Craft and did pretty well in the 20s, went through the 30s, very difficult time in the 30s. And all through Florida, canals were dug, docks were built. Basically, the company was doing anything it could to survive. World War II, you just heard the story of uh, World War II. Uh, came out of World War II in the 50s. The company was doing well, went through the bankruptcy. Spent 20 years investing in uh, trying to pay back, you know, those those vendors. And then things were pretty good. S 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, the family was doing really well. The company was doing well. A lot of success. The Ski Nautique uh, brand of the boat, which they had just taken off at one point at 80, 90% of the market share. And the company was doing, doing very, very well. In the 90s, started to get some cracks in the foundation. And by 2000, the wheels had totally come off. I know I mixed my metaphors there, but if you'll bear with me, uh, the wheels had come off. And the family had um, asked the CEO of the company, who was a family member, had been for 20 years, to step down and start a very tumultuous time for the company. I went through five CEOs in five years. I was the fifth CEO in five years. They recruited me to be the fourth, and I was like, I ain't touching that. And and didn't, but uh, ended up uh, coming and agreeing to come as the fifth CEO in, in five years and got there at the end of 2006, and it was a mess. It was just a mess. You can imagine lots of um, lots of challenges at the ownership level, um, just five CEOs in five years, employees. I literally had employees come up to me and say, you're not going to be here long, okay? We'll see. 
but every, everything was broken at that point. Everything was broken. So a few months after I got there, lots of things to do, very full to do list. Literally, I was going in the morning, going to work at seven in the morning, work until nine at night. It was a very challenging time. I decided to take 25 employees to Tecate, Mexico and build a house for a homeless family. Now, I had people that looked at me and people that told me directly, this is crazy. You know, we've got so many problems. Why, why are you doing this? Why are you... Uh, why are you going to take 25 employees and go to Tecate, Mexico, where it was 109 degrees every day? We slept in the desert. I took showers, put lake water over our head, soap it up, and put lake water over our head to clean off. Why are you doing this at this time of the company's history? But one of the things that I knew was important and one of the things that we needed was a, a, a culture and a culture of service, a culture of something bigger than us. Employees, every organization craves to be part of something bigger than them. And that's why culture is so important. And we've taken that and we've grown that. In the last uh, 16 years, I've taken employees all over the world. I've taken employees to Cambodia, India, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, all across the Kent Central America, all across the Caribbean, and serving. And we'll go and we'll just serve and uh, just serve someplace and just help somebody. We've taken, uh, just uh, in July, we took 100 employees to Monticello, Arkansas, and we served there in um, a safe house for abused women in two orphanages. So... You know, culture is really, really important to us. And culture has had a big impact on our company. We've had a tremendous amount of success. We were about a $40 million company um, in, in 2009. This year, we bumped up over a billion dollars. We've had tremendous growth in the last, uh, last year. Thank you. People ask me sometimes, they'll say, what, what's the secret sauce? You know, how, how has your team been able to do that? And our team's been able to do that because of two things, strategic planning. I'm not going to talk about that today talk about it in the book and culture and the importance, the importance of culture. So uh, we've done a lot of things, you know, making culture really clear, having clear values. Our founder started our company with the value of building boats, to the glory of God. We continue to embrace that now a hundred years later, making life better. That's our why, you know, we want to make life better on everybody that we come in contact with. So culture has had a dramatic impact on our company and our employees embrace it. Our employees want to be part of it. And as I said, Every organization employees want to be part of something much, much bigger th than themselves. So um, this, you can see there, I've, I, uh, the slides off to the side there. In 2009, you see the box over there that says an Altique? That was our only box. This is us today. We're all over the country, and we, uh, as Karen said, we distribute into about 70 countries around the world. So we've seen tremendous growth. And this growth has been a direct result of having a team that's highly engaged, having a team that embraces our mission of making life better. We see every one of those acquisitions that we've done, we make an, when we make an acquisition, our goal, of course, we want to make money. Of course, we want to increase market share, all those things. But we want to make life better in that community. And that's why we go and we immediately invest in improving benefits for employees. And we immediately invest in uh, doing things in the community. And every one of our companies does serve, local service projects in their company, as well as you know co corporate-wide projects that we do. Because culture is important to us. Culture is an important part of what's driven the success of Correct Craft. So the second book, that's a little bit of history of Correct Craft. It's in the blue book. They're making life better. Um, I'll tell you a lot of stories like those stories I already told you and brings you right up to the current day. So I encourage you, if you're interested at all, to read that. But we learned a lot. You know, I mentioned I was the fifth CEO in five years. Um, you know, everything was a mess. And we, uh, we had a great team that's worked really hard and grown our company. And we learned a lot. So the second book you have there in front of you is called Education of CEO. And that's a book I wrote about some of the things that we've learned as a team, some things that we've learned as an organization. And it's really goes into three parts there. And I'm not going to go through, go through all of these. Uh, if you get the book there, you can read it. But um, some of the things that are important to us, and these are the 14 chapters in the book. I'm just going to touch on a couple of them that are related to our culture that hopefully will give you a little insight into us. The first one we talk about is be a learner. Um, it's really, really important to our team that we be learners. We wear little uh, bracelets here that say be a learner on them. Oh, we're not a cult, though. Don't worry. We, uh, you don't have to wear one. <laughs> but we, we, we really want to be a learner. And you say, okay, well, that's sort of a no-brainer. Everybody wants to be a learner. But it, it's not really a no-brainer because very few people are learners. Most people aren't learners. They're knowers. And there's a big difference between a learner and a knower. The difference is if you're a knower... You take in information to confirm what you already believe. 
Okay. You're trying to confirm what you or validate in your mind what you already believe. Learners take in information to learn and to have their mind changed. If you're a learner, you get an endorphin rush when somebody changes your mind because you think, wow, how did I not know that? I'm excited. I'm not upset that I was proven wrong. I'm excited because I've learned something. I've learned something big. I've learned something that's going to make my life better. So we want to be learners. As I said, mo listen, I, I want to be the least judgy guy you've ever met. I don't, it's not my place to judge anybody, but probably 80, 90% of people are knowers. How do you know if you're a knower? Okay. I'm not asking you to raise your hands. But if you always listen to the same news channel, you're probably a knower. If you always read the same kind of books, you're probably a knower. If all your friends think exactly as you do, you're probably a knower. Yeah, we want to be learners. We want to see things from different perspectives. We want to have our thoughts challenged, and we want to we want to be learners. So that's an important, really important part of our um, culture. You'll see a few other things up there. I'm not going to go through all the mindset. Chapter number four, we talk about the importance of mindset. The number one thing that I tell our team that can impact how we think and how we grow is that not only be a learner, which obviously is connected to, to uh, mindset, but have a growth mindset. There's a great book by Carol Dweck. Uh, some of you may have read it called Mindset. And she talks about having a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And how we frame things up in our mind makes a big difference about in how successful we are and what we accomplish. Um, there's a um, there's a saying that comes out of Stoicism that's called, called the obstacle is the way. Most people see an obstacle and they think, oh gosh, how am I going to get around that? And they go a different direction. People that are doers, the successful people, find a way to make the obstacle the way or the way to their success because most people aren't going to do that. And so that's the mindset we want to have. We want to frame things up. We have I'm into challenges. We want to see them as opportunities. And again, that seems simple and it seems elementary, but most people don't naturally do that. And so we we have a big challenge. We say, hey, the obstacle is the way. We're going to figure out a way to turn this to our advantage. Uh, some of the other ones, uh, eye for talent. You know, it's all about people. If you know me very well, um, I can't do much of anything. Um, you know, at, we've got 20, over 2,000 employees. Every one of them could do their job better than I could step in and do their job. Uh, so I, I need a great team around me. And often we'll say in our company in meetings, we'll say, when we have a problem or a challenge, we'll say, it's not how, it's who. And I've had many people over the years come to me with a problem. They'll come and they'll want them to talk or call them and say, gosh, I've got this problem in my organization. And, and it, you can just see them light up when you say, don't think how you're going to fix it. Think who's going to fix it. If you don't have who's that can fix it, well, you need different who's. You need who's on your team who can fix it. So it's not about, as leaders, we don't have to, I don't come up with the how for hardly anything. I'm not that smart. I'm not that talented. But I do have the right who's, and I work with a team of who's and people that are very smart and are very talented. So it's not how, it's who. How, how are you going to do this? So we think of that as it relates to talent, a lot of other things we could talk about there. Clarity, this is one of the things that um, is really important to our culture and something I talk about all the time is we need to provide clarity. You know, we need to provide clarity. Most bosses, most leaders have a really hard time providing clarity. Listen, if you're a, if you're a leader and you want to be successful, I'll give you three things you can do and you do these three things, you can accomplish anything, all right? You get the right who's, get the right people, you provide clarity on what your expectation is of them, and you become an energizer, number seven on the list. If you get the right people, you tell them what the mission is, and you're crystal clear on that. Most leaders have a hard time being crystal clear on that because sometimes they're not sure in their own mind. But if you're crystal clear on that and you be an energizer, as a leader, you know, you've got to be an energizer. You got to provide energy to your team. You know, you've had a bad day, you've had a fight with your spouse, the dog peed on the carpet. Somebody cut you off on the way to work. You go into work. You know what? You got to put all that stuff aside. You got to provide energy to your team because your team gets their energy from you. So get the right who, create clarity, provide energy. You can accomplish You can accomplish anything. So a couple other things on there, uh, being future focused and innovative. Um, you know, we work really hard to be looking out 10, 15 years. Uh, I went with some of our team out to Silicon Valley a couple of months ago, and we spent a week out there. Uh, with a group, just look at what is the what is the change that's happening over the next uh, uh, 10, 15 years than we expect. Uh, computational power is increasing incredibly. You guys have all heard of Moore's Law, right? And and computation power is increasing incredibly. This phone, and this is not the most recent one, you know, it's 
basically for me, as long as it's working, I keep it. And, you know, that phone would have cost $50 million to get that kind of computational power 20 years ago. And it's, it's continuing to grow. That computational power is driving technological change. That technological change is transforming business models, just transforming the world. So, you know, your business, whatever you're doing right now, if you're doing the same thing in 10 years, you're likely to be out of business. And so that's part of our culture. We're constantly looking out ahead. You know, we've been awarded multiple years in 35,000 companies in our industry, and we've been not recognized as the most innovative company in our industry multiple times because we're looking out ahead. We want to look out ahead 10, 15 years and what do we need to be doing today because the world's changing fast. Whatever you're doing today, you won't be doing 10 years from now. And if you are, you'll be out of business. So look out ahead. And then the last thing I'm going to jump back is number 11 is culture. We talk a lot about culture and the importance of culture. And I believe it's the single most important thing you can do in any organization to drive great results is have a great culture. So why not? Why do, why do, why do leaders, why don't all leaders embrace it? You know, a lot of leaders are just about how do we squeeze out the last penny? How do we make the most amount of money? Listen, we're all about making money. We're profitable. We do well. You know, so we're all about making money. A lot of leaders, that's their main focus. You know, we got to make money. Not, we're, how do we make life better, our employees and our communities and so forth? That just feels a little counterintuitive. Why do we learn to adopt a culture strategy? And this is it. Okay, this, if, you, if you walk away with this, you can't think of culture as an expense. You have to think of culture as an investment. And if you think of culture as an investment, it's got a huge return. As CEO of CorectCraft, one of my most important jobs is asset allocation. You know, we've got resources. We can invest in a lot of things. I've got to think about, okay, where do we take our resources and how do I invest them? And how do I, how do we, our team, invest them in a way that's profitable to our company and a good return on our investment? There is no investment you can make that's better for your organization and has got a higher return than investing in culture. It's not an expense that you cut out when things get a little tough. It's an expense you double down on when things get a little tough. So if you can get, the, if you can be a learner with me for a second and think, okay, this is an expense for my organization. This is an investment that's going to have a huge, huge return more than I can even imagine. You get that part right, uh, you'll, uh, you'll really get the message of today. So how do you drive culture? Sometimes people will say to me, okay, well, it's, it just feels so mystical. It just feels so... I don't know, I, I, how do I do that? I don't even, I wouldn't even know where to start. Driving culture in organizations is really, really simple. Okay, there's four steps, and I'm going to give you the four steps, and if you'll listen carefully and you'll, you'll remember these, you can transform your organization, okay? Guaranteed, transform your organization. Number one, you have to identify what's important, okay? Identify what's important in your organization and what your values are. What's important to you? What are your values? How do you, um, yeah, how do you function? How do you and show the team how do you interact with the marketplace identify what's important but second you've got to capture them in a way that's easy to understand we had um after shortly after i got to correct craft we had all these things that i'd be talking about all the time you know the who not how all these things and they'd be floating out there and so i asked our team um a long time ago to put them in a a form that we could really understand our values and we came up with this this is our culture pyramid some of you have seen this um we have to come up with a clear way to communicate our culture. You don't have to do a pyramid. You can do it any way you want. This is what, uh, this is our pyramid. This captures our values. I talked to you about before. Our founder talked about building boats to the glory of God. Our why is making life better. If I had a Craft shirt on today, I don't today, but if I did, I do most days, it would say making life better, craft, making life better. We want to make life better on every single person we come into contact with, even if they're a competitor. We want to make their life better. And then it breaks down to three parts. I'm not going to go through all of it with you, but people performance and philanthropy. You know, we want to invest heavy in our people, heavy. And we do. We have people that their entire job, it runs CreckCraft. Uh, we have uh, CreckCraft University. We have CreckCraft Culture Camp. We'll bring 25 employees in at a time into Orlando. We'll fly them around the country. They'll spend two and a half days with me personally and some of our team. And we just invest in culture in them. We want to invest in our, cult, in our, in our team. I've told our team before I travel around the country, visit some of our locations. I'll normally say something to the fact of if you're working at a correct craft company and you're not learning, it's because you've chosen not to learn because we've got plenty of opportunities. 
for you to do that. So important part of our culture is people. Performance. We're a very high performing company. We do really well. We've got, when you have employees that are engaged, employees that are part of something that's bigger than themselves, they perform really well. And you, you do, and that's, that's, that's a great part of having a great culture is that people perform well. Now get this, this is important. If you create a positive culture, well, let me say it a little better. Culture drives financial performance and it drives it, has a great impact on financial performance. Unless, this is important, unless you develop a culture to drive financial performance. Okay? Culture drives financial performance unless that's the reason you have your culture. Because people can see through that and they feel manipulated and they feel used. But if the culture is real to you and the things that we've talked about today, they're real. you really or truly care about your team, you care about your communities, that has the spillover effect of having great financial performance. And then philanthropy. Uh, we're heavily involved with our own team. You know, each of our companies has money that we've um, allocated to them to invest in their team when somebody has a need or a problem or a challenge with their family. Uh, we, every one of our companies invests in our local communities. And we're, uh, we do everything from trash pickups to Habitat for Humanity to anything really that you can think of, you know, our teams are doing. And then the global outreach that I talked to you a little bit about. So step number two is find a clear way to present it. This is how we've chosen to present our culture. You can do it different or you can use a pyramid. I've given this conversation, I've had this conversation with many groups over the last few years. And I can't tell you how many times I've come back to a group a year later and somebody will come up to me with their phone and say, our pyramid. And we'll show me how they've done it. So it's a great way. We love it, basically, but you, you don't have to do it that way. Okay, so that's step number two. Number one, identify what's important to you. Number two, if you're not sure what's important to you, steal ours. Steal somebody else's. I'll get you started, okay? Number two, find a clear way to present it. Number three, communicate it over and over and over and over again. Okay, you've got to talk about culture until you're tired of talking about it and they're tired of hearing you say it. Okay, but it's the only way you're going to create clarity and make it important is they have to see that's important and they need to hear from the leadership that it's important. So you have to keep talking about it. So identify what's important, find a way to communicate it, talk about it over and over. And then the fourth thing is to model it. As a leader, you have to model it. As CEO of Correct Craft, yeah, I talk about this stuff all the time. But if people see me talking one way and acting another, they're not, they're always going to, they're always going to make they're determine what your values are based on what they see you do, not what they hear you say, always. So you have to model it. Now that means one of our, you see one of our uh, values up there is highly cooperative, highly assertive. We, that means we want people to speak up. We talk about no silent liars. We don't want any silent liars. If you're in a meeting with the CEO and the CEO says something stupid, we want you to say it up and say, hey, we want you to be respectful and polite. We want you to say, hey, I think there's another way to think about that. We want everybody to do that. And if you don't do that, you're what we call silent liar. So we really encourage that. But so if I'm in a meeting with a bunch of employees and I say something and one of the employees thinks, man, Bill's really lost it. It's like, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. And they respectfully and politely say, hey, uh, Bill, I think maybe you should consider it this way. And I jump on them or I don't listen carefully and try to understand what they're saying. Everything, I, everything else I say isn't going to matter because I've got to model that. Now, I also tell our employees, I say, don't watch, don't hold that, set me up as your example, because if you watch me close enough, I'll let you down, because I'm human, we're all human, we're all going to make mistakes, I'm always, I'm going to do stuff that's not consistent with our culture, but you generally got to, you got to really, really try to model it. So, a couple of things, think of culture as an investment with a huge return, I've seen it over and over again, not in just our companies, but a lot of other companies that I've been involved with, and um Create it. Here's your four steps to create it. So this is the Economics Club of Florida, right? So you all know who Milton Friedman is. Milton Friedman is uh, one of the 20th century's most renowned economists. He won the Nobel Prize, a uh, really well-known economist. Uh, Milton Friedman, about 50 years ago, said something that are, is still irritating people today. Okay? Milton Friedman said that corporations' number one priority by far, is to provide profits for the shareholders. That's what Milton Friedman said. Nobel Prize winning economists, said that's the corporation's number one objective, is to provide money for the shareholders. And people are still upset about that today. And they say, well, no, corporations got much bigger responsibilities. So 
I'm not going to get into the Milton Friedman debate, but let me tell you how Milton Friedman might be right. I'm convinced that if you invest in culture genuinely, not manipulatively, if you genuinely invest in culture in your organization, it'll be good for everybody, including the shareholders, because there's a huge return. So when I talk about the economics culture, the title of today's session, that's the economics of culture. You invest in culture in your organization, it's great for your communities. It's great for your employees. It's great for your vendors, your other business partners, and it's great for your shareholders because you can have a lot of business success by focusing on culture, but it's gotta be genuine. If you're just doing anything, oh gosh, I've learned the secret. Now I'm gonna go out and you know make it, that, that doesn't work because people will see through that. So I hope, uh, I hope I've inspired you a little bit to focus on culture, you know, at your organizations and in your community. And it does, the economics are really positive. There's a huge return. So um, I thank you very much. Um, do we have time for questions? Okay. Thank you. We have a microphone here. If anybody would like to ask a question or two, Bill. Thanks. You know, you just think of the uh, future of voting and what that looks like from an energy perspective as well. So uh, we have, I'm trying to give you a short version of this, but I'll give you this sort of the medium version. We are, we try to be very innovative. Um, if you're, if any of you have ever read Christian Clay, Clayton Christensen's book, in, The Innovator's Dilemma, you'll know that innovation is very difficult in organiza existing organizations. And basically, and this is a, a, the theory that's embraced in much of the business world now, is that existing organizations are really good at sustaining innovation. What sustaining innovation means is making your products and services better. Existing organizations are really bad at disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is normally an idea that comes from the periphery that significantly disrupts the organization. The reason companies are bad at that is because they've got Kodak. Kodak invented the digital camera, the same thing that put them out of business, right? But they were, that wasn't their business. You know, they were in making film and processing chemicals. And, and so it put them out of business because they wouldn't embrace what they themselves had invented. So um, we understand this. We want all of our companies to be really good at sustaining innovation, but we've set up a separate entity um, for disruptive innovation. So it's called Watershed Innovation. They're doing all kinds of crazy stuff and exciting stuff. We've got an electric boat company, a telematics company, and robotics. We're doing all kinds of stuff through that um, disruptive innovation company. So the first thing when you think of innovation is don't try to do innovate. Don't try to do disruptive innovation um, through your existing organization, your existing people, because it's almost impossible. If you do it, you'll be one in a million. But if you if you can focus on getting outside perspective, maybe an outside team, then you can focus on disruptive. So what's that mean for the boating industry? Well, uh, you know, we're doing 3D printing now, robotics. Uh, we formed a telematics company, Osmosis, so we can, um, you know, track boats. Um, there's all kinds of privacy laws about, around this. Obviously, we comply with them. But we can track boats um, all over the world, give owners all kinds of, maybe very similar to what you have in your, like the Ellen Star and like Chevy Tahoe. You know, it's very similar. I'll tell you a funny story. One of our dealers had a boat, hadn't been sold. It was in a marina in Atlanta. And he had the boat in the water and uh, somebody stole the boat, took it, like took it off out of the marina. So uh, they did, it was on Lake Lanier, which we've been there's a huge lake. And they didn't know where the boat was. So the dealer called our team in Orlando and said, hey, can you tell us where this boat was? Boat is. The police were there. And so, yes, yeah, this spot. And so um, the police and our dealer got several boats and they went out. The guy saw them and took off. Okay, took off. Now, eventually, the police boat obviously eventually would have caught him. He would have run out of gas, but it was very dangerous, you know, for this guy to be running away with a boat like Lanier. So with the police's recommendation, they called back and said, Hey, can you stop him? So we shut the boat down. The police got on the boat and arrested the guy. So that's telematics. The thing a lot of people are interested in is electric. And elect, we have an electric boat company. It's called Ingenity. And we've sold a bunch of electric boats. In fact, if you look at the top six richest people in the world, we've sold two of them electric boats. And so we've signed NDAs. So I can't tell you who they are, but probably wouldn't be too hard to figure out. But 
And so we've uh, we're, we've invested a lot, millions of dollars into electric boating. Electric for boats is much, much more difficult than cars. It's not because anything to do with the water. In cars, an electric car um, with an electric engine, if you're driving a car 70 miles an hour down the highway and you let off the gas, assuming you're not going uphill, that car will go maybe for a couple of miles before it stops. In a boat, when you let off the gas, in a boat, what happens? It stops. The reason a boat doesn't need a brake is because you're constantly pushing through water. So pushing through water takes a tremendous amount more energy than driving on the road. So that's a big challenge that we're having in our industries having is because it takes so much. That, so that basically it takes the battery technology. There's three parts of an electric boat. You got the motor, the commodity, dime a dozen. You got the software. We can write the software we have and you got batteries. Uh, the battery technology is what's holding it back because it uses so much bat energy to push the boat through the, through the water. And so, and but by the way, whether you're Tesla, General Motors, or Ingenuity, our company, you're dealing with the same exact battery technology. Nobody's got an edge on this. We're all dealing with the same thing. There's all kinds of talk about the next few years, you know, new battery technology, but that's the biggest challenge. So I'm going to be in Portugal in two weeks uh, for a big industry meeting I'm speaking at. And at that meeting, they're going to reveal, it's called the Ricardo Report. Don't tell anybody. Can we keep this between us? Because this... So... Um, they're going to basically uh, recommend the best way for um, our industry to try to be moved towards carbon neutrals through sustainable fuels. There's all kinds of issues with that. But they have a huge impact and they don't hurt the boat. So we're focused on it. So there's just a few things to answer your question. Yeah. Sir. Larry. Uh, Bill, thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. I thank really you. appreciate the uh, the concept of culture and how important that is. We, and, and the and the importance in your industry of being able to look into the future and so on. You know, I don't think most of us envisioned how COVID and on all of that forced changes in how we did work. I mean, who of us knew about Zoom, how many people were able to work from home and so on. Talk a little bit about the challenges in creating that culture when you have so many different ways of people working completely virtually in a hybrid thing. You know, how much do you need in-person um, challenges with childcare, all of the other kinds of things that in these days and times, and then extrapolate, you know, 10 to 15 years on down the road, how do you maintain that culture with all of the cultural changes that are taking place in our society right now? That's a great question. That's a question a lot of people are wrestling with right now because we are primarily manufacturing uh, you can't manufacture from home. You have to be there. So the vast majority of our employees, the only employees that we really have working remotely now are sales reps, which are based all over the world. And But they were working remotely before COVID. We did learn a lot, though. I mean, we learned that, you know, listen, I, I travel, you know, before COVID, I was traveling every single week. As I said, we got 20 locations around the country. We're in 70 countries. And I'm traveling more than I want to now. But, you know, I can have a Zoom call with somebody and it's pretty effective. You know, so um, it is. it has made us much more efficient and we have Zoom calls, you know, with our teams around the country. But in our business, we don't have a lot. We are, um, some of our CAD people, some of our full stack engineers, they work from home, but the vast majority of us still come to the office. So, I'm sorry, I'm not sure we're probably not a good example because the manufacturing, Larry and everybody. Went. Hi, um, Becky Tolnay. I hey, spent Becky. 30 years with the Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. So huge respect for you and, and what you've created and a culture and your, a long Your old CEO wrote a great book. Or Sultzy. Yeah, Howard. What was the name of it? I'm directing. Um, yeah, anyway, yeah, it's a great it's book. A Something about excellence. But it it is. Excellence and leadership. Excellent. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was a really good book. I read it. Wonderful, wonderful stories. I really appreciate you sharing with us. Um, you talked a lot about the who and getting uh, the right people and uh, lots of language around that, but um, I'm curious about, we don't always get it right when we're selecting yeah. people. So what are your processes in place when you don't get the right who in the yeah. in the company? Well, when we don't get the right who, we pull out Dr. Henry Cloud's book, Necessary Endings, and which, which is which is a really good book if you haven't read it. Uh, he talks about how sometimes you have to make, but, but we look at, you know, we talk about who, not how, we look at three things, character, competency, and chemistry. And so we look, we, we look at people that have all three of those. Generally, when I'm in, I don't do that much interviewing, but when somebody makes it to my office to interview, 
I'm assuming they have competency. I'm assuming they can do the job because they've made it a few people. So I'm looking for character and chemistry. Let me tell you the biggest mistake I've made. I've made it multiple times over my career. I'm hoping to get to the end of my career without making it again, but I've done this many times is I can get captured by a problem and find somebody who's got the right competency, but they don't have the right chemistry and character. That's my weakness. And what I would never intentionally hire somebody who didn't have the right character or the right chemistry, but I can be like, this is our problem. She can fix it. When can you start? Yeah, that I'm simplifying, but, and so, and when I do that, I always end up regretting it because often I've hired somebody who's very competent, but if they don't have the right character, if they don't bring their values, they don't have the right chemistry, they can't get along with other you know people in the organization, outside the organization, you're just not going to last. We don't care how good you are. You've got to have, you know, you've got to have those other values. So we try to look for all three. So I don't think I did a good job. Let's just question. have a quick follow-up, yeah. which is in your selection process, how do you, how do you identify that character and that, that um, culture part? That well, there's all the traditional HR, you know, references and so forth. I, I had to, I had a, this is, this is, um, I had a lady a couple of years ago who was applying actually to be director of HR of one of our companies. And for some reason they asked, Hey Bill, would you meet her? We'd like, I normally wouldn't interview for that role, but they said, would you meet her? So I had her resume and it's had an MBA somewhere. I said, oh, MBA, tell me about your program. She said something. I said, uh, uh, what was your uh, favorite class or something? She said, well, actually, I'm still in the program. I haven't finished yet. I said, oh, okay, well, that's odd because it said, you know, an MBA. And I said, oh, okay, well, um, you know, how many classes have you taken? And she said, uh, well, actually, uh, just one. And, and I said, um, oh, well, which one was that? She said, well, actually, it was the orientation. And so, so part of it is just the typical asking, getting references, so forth. And then the other part of it is just sitting, looking somebody in the eye, and you know, having them tell you their story. You know what's important to them, trying to understand, you know, their values, and making sure they fit, and they're going to agree to focus on people, performance, and philanthropy. Thank you, thank you. Congratulations again on your success. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your comments today. So I have two questions. Okay. Um, is he allowed two or is this just one? Okay. All right. Uh, so the first question is sort of a piggyback on Larry's question. And that is, how did you take culture and use that to solve some of the problems during the COVID pandemic about whether employees are going to be able to stay at home and how long and when do they return to work, things of that type. And then the second question is, obviously culture is an extremely important part of yourself, your being. So what was it that happened in your life? When in your life did you realize that? Was there some experience that you had that taught you how important culture was? Oh, good, good questions. Uh, the first one, as it relates to COVID, um, you know, we just tried really hard to make decisions through the lens of, you know, we're impacting 2,000 people, not just 2,000 people, we're affecting, impacting thousands of people because we think of spouses and children and and so forth. And so, um, you know, looking through the lens, we try to make decisions that are not just, you know, financial decisions, but what's going to impact the lives of our people. We did in 2008, um, in the fall of 2008, you know, the, we had the financial crisis. And at the time, we were a much smaller company. We were building 65 boats a week, and we dropped to three boats a week. At the time, we had about 500 employees. So 65 to three clearly didn't need hundreds of people that we had. So I met with our team and I, I, I just tried to be very transparent. One of the things we tried to be very transparent, very honest. And I met with our team and I said, we don't know what's going on. How long is this going to last? We're sure in the fall of the war. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. So I said, this is what we're going to do. I said, everybody's got a job for two months. I said, we don't have enough boats to build for the next two months, so we don't have boat, boat work for you to do. But I work with our HR team, and we brought in everybody that we could and just started teaching anybody who wanted to learn anything. We taught people who didn't speak English how to speak English. We taught welding or, you know, all kinds of different technical skills. We took employees and went to uh, the Coalition for the Homeless in Orlando. We spent two days with 100 people just redoing their place. And so we, and I, I told them, though, I said, I, I can't promise you you know, we're committed employees, but you know, you can't get out of a term, term right? We got to have business to pay people. And so I said, you know, two months, we'll give you two months. And I said, I'm going to do everything 
we we are going to do everything that we can to make sure at the end of two months that you've got whatever skills you need to be marketable somewhere else. So whatever you want to learn, talk to Shirley, she was HR lady at the time. We'll try to make sure that you can learn that over the next two months while we've got this time. At the end of the two months, we had to do, we had very, very sizable, you know, reduction in our team. So, but we looked at it through the lens of what are we going to do? We're, we're fortunate to be able to afford to pay them for two months. And, you know, we just tried our best to invest in them. So that's probably the best, um, you know, example. And it's an example that seems that people seem to, seem to resonate with people, you know, that we, uh, you know, we want to help people and we want to help people. Oh, we get during COVID, um, you know, we paid people for a time. We had people that um, were sent home. Our California facility, California was the toughest state. No surprise there, right? But uh, we were shut down there 11 weeks. So I told our team, I said, while well, we're not open, while you're not getting paid, I'm not going to get paid. I was at the office working every day during COVID. I didn't have a vacation that year. You know, I was working every day. But I said, while well, you're not getting paid, I'm not going to get paid. Because I don't want you, know, you to feel like, oh, well, he's, you know, I want to be in it with you. And I did, you know, I missed some paychecks and, um, because that was, you know, it was important to send a message to our employees. This is our art, you know, we're all going to be in this together. So anyway, I lost you. Oh, the second question, you know, I'm very, very blessed. I grew up in a really strong family. I think my mom's watched our line. I'm uh, getting ready to talk about you. Um, so, um, yeah, I grew up in a very strong family. You know, these, a lot of these values came up our family, um, you know, growing up, um, my dad passed away, um, when I was in my thirties, um, about 25 years ago. And, you know, my dad was the, um, single most highest integrity person, you know, that I'd ever met and, uh, went to really had Parkinson's and had a really, really tough several years. Uh, last two weeks of his life, I slept on the floor next to his bed in hospice. I mean, he was, he had a close family and my dad was important to me. So I think seeing, you know, just that was a that was another time where I just really said, okay, yes, I will. You guess that what's important? Yeah, you know, one, you're gonna, you know, your kid's gonna be standing around, you know, in your hospice room someday, hopefully not too soon. But, um, and you know, that was just sort of another time where really it was a resetting for me of okay, what's you know really important? You get side of what's really important. Life. So those are a couple of things I think had a huge influence on me. We done? Wasn't he great? What y'all giving? Next part. We have the economic club. We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all again for coming today. Remember, our next one is October 5th. And if you um, just would RSVP, that really helps us plan. Thank you.